Tonight we voyage into unknown worlds through the medium of science fiction. Very pleased that tonight's four stories will be introduced to you by the fantastic Tony to Metal. He's a brilliant narrator in his own right, and as far as I'm concerned, doesn't get as much attention as he deserves. So, after listening to these stories, head over to his channel, check out his videos, like, comment, and subscribe. Now, without further ado, I hand you over. Our journey begins at the dawn of man's exploration of the stars. We think we know the story of the pioneering Soviet cosmonauts, but do we really? On April 12, 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space and also the first to orbit the Earth. But some people believe that Gagarin was not the first in space. He was only the first to return alive. The following is an account of a lost cosmonaut, Gavril Kotsov. June 21st, 1960. The Vostok rocket sat on the launch pad at Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, USSR. It was the day of the first attempted launch of a human into space, and with that, orbit. Cosmonaut Gavril Kotsov sat in his Vostok module, ready to make history. A voice came over his intercom. Major Kotsov, how are you feeling this morning? It was mission control. Just fine, sir. Ready to go. Kotsov radioed back. Kotsov Vostok 3KA rocket looked ready to go. Kotsov was good to go. Everything seemed as it should have. Seemed. The rocket went through the final pre-flight checks, and then ignition. It was released from the base stabilizers. The main engine and four boosters activated properly. Poltsov was accelerating at 200 meters per second, eventually reaching upwards of 300 meters per second. The fuel on the boosters were almost empty. Booster's gone, a voice said over the radio. The four boosters disconnected. The rocket shuddered for a second and kept going, accelerating with the loss of weight. Another minute passed. The rocket kept going, now at around 50,000 meters above Earth. The fuel on the current stage ran out, and it came time to decouple the stage. The rocket now pitched to get orbital velocity. When the lower half of the rocket decoupled, something didn't feel right to Gavriel. He radioed command. Come in. This is Major Koltsov to control. Yes, Major. Is everything all right? A voice came back. I just decoupled the stage, and something shuddered. It just didn't feel right. He received a reply. No, no. Nonsense, Major. Everything is reading fine down here. Koltsov was now nervous. He frantically scanned his panels, checking everything. His fuel gauge. It was dropping fuel faster than it should have been. He checked his throttle at about 65%, just where it should be. Command, I am losing fuel. Throttle is where it should be. Are you seeing anything wrong? On Earth, Mission Control was reading that Koltsov had a fuel leak, most likely caused when the first stage decoupled. Instead of worrying the cosmonaut and informing him, Control did not tell him. If he knew, he would panic and start to attempt a return burn to re-enter the atmosphere. Major, I understand you are under anxiety, but you are fine. Do not worry. You are almost in orbit, Command said, as Koltsov was at the correct altitude to enter a good orbit. Koltsov corrected his heading to get into a circular orbit. His fuel was nearly empty. It was at 
when it should be around 70%. What the hell? Come on, come in, come in. I am almost empty. Come on, Koltsov yelled frantically into his mic. Come on, come in. God damn it. His orbit was off. While he radioed command, he accidentally pitched the craft. He was in an escape orbit from Earth. He grabbed control and attempted to fix his course, at least to get into an elliptical orbit where he would enter Earth's atmosphere to return. He started to pitch, but his craft shuddered and his engine stopped. His fuel was dry. His situation hopeless. His craft was stuck in an escape orbit. Kortsov never heard back from command. He tried once more. Command, come in. This is Major Kodsov. I am out of fuel and on an escape orbit from Earth. Is there anything we can do? Kodsov said. He never heard back. He looked through his porthole into a black void. He only had enough food for his planned flight, which was supposed to be three hours. He pitched his craft so he could look at Earth through his porthole. It was getting smaller. He'd run out of electrical charge four hours into the flight. His oxygen ran out 22 hours in. He knew he was done for. But he tried one last time to tell command of his situation. Come in. His voice slowed, as he had issues breathing. Anyone, come in. This is... This is Major Gav Gavril Kodsov. He could barely finish his sentence. Is there anything... Anything we can do? There was no signal. He was out of oxygen out of food, out of electricity, out of hope. Gavril looked out of his porthole at Earth. The blue planet was beautiful, but the thought gripped Gavril. He would never see it again. He would never see his home, his family, friends. His family would get a telegraph saying he was killed in some training accident. But they would not know that he'd made history. He had become the first man in space. He knew, but he knew that they would not find out. He closed his eyes one final time. Drifting away from Earth. Forgotten. We continue our journey with an exploration of Jupiter's moon Europa. We believe this to be a candidate for alien life. But what might we find there? Europa is one of the many moons of Jupiter. Its most interesting characteristic is its thick layer of ice, covering a liquid water ocean very similar to our own. The water is kept from solidifying by the gravitational pull of Jupiter, causing heat to vent from the ocean floor. This is very similar to vents on Earth's ocean floors, which are teeming with life. The various temperatures, ranging from warm to freezing, would allow any potential life to avoid the warm-blooded size barrier brought on by overheating. Size would only be limited by the supporting ecosystem. Any potential life would also develop in complete darkness, leading to creatures very similar to our own deep sea organisms, like the anglerfish and viperfish. In 1997, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the NOAA, detected an ultra-low frequency extremely powerful underwater sound in the South Pacific Ocean. This sound is colloquially called the bloop. 
its source remains unknown. But the sound is similar to that made by marine animals. This has led most scientists to believe that whatever made the sound is an animal. To make sound of this magnitude, the creature would have to be several times the size of a blue whale. This sound was recorded in waters that are just a couple of miles deep. The ocean of Europa is believed to be 62 miles deep. As we know, the race to reach Mars is now upon us. Our next story considers who might get there first and what they may find. NASA are not the only ones in the USA trying to send spacecraft into space. There are plenty of brilliant, yet unknown, engineering minds attempting, but failing, to make something break the walls of the atmosphere. Well, at least they were in my neighborhood several years ago. It was a quiet, small place with a low population, but almost half of the people in it were amazing at engineering especially things that had to do with spacecraft and rockets and all that. I had no idea what had drawn all these geniuses to this small town, or why they all wanted to launch their little test spaceships up into the sky in a specific part of town, the small park. But when it happened, almost all of the people that lived there went to watch. It always failed. Everyone kept hush about this whole little space program we had going on here, so the government wouldn't investigate and find where we'd gotten the parts from, or something like that. In late 2007, a group of four geniuses had gotten together to build something that would actually work, and had a little twist to go along with it. I didn't know what this twist was, but they spread the rumor to keep people interested. The four people were the brightest minds in town and the rest of the engineers were said to be too unstable to work on something as big as this. So the engineers quit their high-paying jobs, <clears throat> received some parts, I'm not sure in a totally legal way, and then went to work. They'd hidden away and built the thing for over a year, and in January 2009, when everyone had forgotten about the whole thing, they finally appeared carrying a box the size of a small cow, covered in a black sheet. The scientists looked unclean, unshaven, very skinny, and as pale as the snow on the ground. They looked like they hadn't slept or eaten in days. But I saw something else, a look of fear in their eyes, like they were nervous about something. I figured it was just fretting over if their year-long project would fail and it would all go to waste. As they brought it to the town park, as was where all the spacecraft were launched, all of them took off the black sheet to reveal what looked like a random jumble of metal pieces, along with a round black orb on top of it, and tons of skinny landing legs. I wasn't so sure of this thing taking off, let alone landing wherever they wanted it to land. Someone in the large crowd asked what the black orb on top was. The presumed leader of the engineers replied, in a quiet, raspy whisper, as if he'd lost his voice or just hadn't talked in a long time. <laughs> microphone! He didn't look at the one who asked the question, just off into the distance, like he was plotting the path the spacecraft would take. With a monitoring device in his hand, he launched. Everyone cheered, but the scientists just looked up into the sky with tears in their red eyes, before looking at the device for what seemed like twenty minutes. Then one of them said, in the same raspy whisper, that the craft had broken the atmosphere and gone into outer space. None of them smiled. The crowd cheered yet again, even louder and longer this time as their small town had finally achieved something great. During this celebration, I was wondering why the engineers were so sad, angry, even spiteful. 
Maybe they were really tired, or had grown to hate their device after working on it for over a year. Either way, I was convinced that they were even smarter and better than the people at NASA now. Just four people, in a year, building such a small yet functional spacecraft. This was truly amazing. This wasn't included in the news or published anywhere. It was just a small town thing. I thought maybe the satellites could detect the small ship, but it was far too small, and probably would have been thought of as just space debris. In 2011, the spacecraft came back to our town, landing almost exactly where it had taken off, in the park. Everyone's amazement had come back in full force. As three of the engineers went over to it, the Thoth one had got his job back and had to work today. They were happy and healthy again after taking a break for over two years. And now was their time to collect the data. They inspected the ship, looked to see what had broken. Considering the thing had landed on Mars and had come back, it was in great shape. But when the scientists went over to the microphone and its data, they got the paleness and scared look in their eyes once again. No one wanted to be the one to take out the audio recorded on it and listen to it. Mm, maybe we should wait for him to get back, one of them said, referring to the engineer who was at work. Speaking of the devil, ten seconds later he came driving down in his car to check it out. Again, the engineer saw the microphone and instantly had a look of panic. Now was the time. It was about two weeks before the content of the audio was revealed, and it was just over three minutes long. Only one of the engineers went to talk about what they'd heard, and how they'd cropped the original four-hour-long recording. What he said horrified me. The first scientist, the self-proclaimed leader of the group, had plugged his ears and had started screaming only about eight seconds into it being played. He was crying and seemed to be hallucinating when he'd heard it and screamed for it to be stopped. When it did, he left the building they were all in and had been missing, not picking up his phone for the last two weeks. Two of the other ones had lost all bodily control when the fourth engineer skipped halfway into the recording involuntarily urinating, defecating, and having seizures. One lost the ability to breathe properly, and had subsequently died. While the other is still alive, but has been sent to a mental asylum, and has lost the ability to communicate. By this point, many in the crowd were crying, and were very scared, due to the speakers next to him, ready to play the three-minute cropped recording. Many had run out of the crowd and to their home to plug their ears and hide. The scientist mumbled, cowards, under his breath. Then someone in the crowd asked the question we were all thinking. But how are you affected by it? The engineer smirked, clearly feeling perfectly fine. Even happy despite the death, disappearance and insanity of his peers. I would have expected him to be pale and scared, and he was confident and was grinning the entire time. It calmed me. I feel more pure now, ready to do anything. In fact, the part I cropped is my favorite. Part at the end makes me feel the best. People have very mixed reactions to it. Here, why don't I just turn on the speakers and... I didn't let him finish. I ran to the front of the crowd, where he was talking, grabbed the speakers and audio player he had the disc in. I ran. I ran and ran and ran, without thinking, without going to my house, just running straight. I wasn't going to let this absolute maniac get to me. I ended up midway in the local woods, crying and screaming, not able to be quiet. I took the CD out of the audio player, and stamped and kicked on it to destroy it, and put the disc in my pocket and sneaked it to my house. Now, I'm here, 
almost four years later listening to the disc that I had completely forgotten about. When I got into my house that fateful day, I played the CD, ready to die, go insane, or anything, because I was so damn scared that nothing mattered anymore to me. The thing didn't cause me to go crazy or kill myself. It just filled me with dread and made me feel paranoid and like I was being watched while listening to it. Now that I listen to it again, it fills me with the same effect, getting worse the more I focus on the sounds of Mars. But if I'm distracted, it's not that bad. I can't let anyone else listen to this, though. There is way too much risk for horrible things to happen. I don't know why these things happen due to listening, but I don't want to find out. The maniacal engineer was apparently killed by being trampled by the large crowd. Now, the neighborhood has no engineers, much less astronomical engineers. Sure, the average income is down, and we don't get to watch spacecraft take off every month. But at least things like this won't happen again any time soon. In our final story, we look further into the future. A meteor is headed towards Earth, but what mysteries does it hold? In the late 21st century, two giant floating structures were built over Manhattan and floated over the docks. The purpose of these structures, called stations, was to track all objects, planes, ships, and so on, coming into the US through the East Coast. They were also used by the military and secret services for other purposes. There was a large section of Station 1, used as a launch pad for US Air Force airships. Similar stations were constructed in San Francisco, Seattle, Washington DC, and Dallas. It was the 5th of July, 2106, and Independence Day celebrations were over. Staff at both Manhattan stations continued their daily routine, monitoring air and sea traffic and the like. NASA had discovered a few meteors entering the solar system a few days beforehand, but said they wouldn't come anywhere near Earth. But, at 6.05 a.m., they announced that one of the meteors had changed its flight path and was headed directly towards Earth. The place it was going to hit? New York City. Evacuations soon began, and the staff of both Manhattan stations were tasked with monitoring the meteor as it entered Earth's orbit. At 7.56 a.m., the U.S. Air Force stationed at Station 1 were ordered to evacuate citizens who had made it to evacuation points dotted throughout the city. Ten minutes later, NASA announced that the meteor would annihilate most of the city, no matter which part of the city it struck. By now, many of the staff at both stations were busy monitoring the meteor, as it had just entered Earth's orbit. They were shocked to find that it had slowed down, not enough to stop it destroying a great deal of New York, though. At 8.59, the meteor began to slow down once again and finally became visible in the morning sky. Staff at Station 1 became nervous, as the meteor appeared to be headed directly towards them. Many began to head to the escape pods, which shot out and slowly glided down to the deserted Manhattan streets. 9.26 came, and the inevitable happened. The meteor crashed into the lower area of Station 1, right in the middle of the Air Force section. No fragments of the meteor passed out through the other side of the station. It had embedded itself in the structure. A smoke cloud began to rise, visible from as far off as Queens. Staff in Station 2 looked in horror at the devastation caused by the meteor. Station 2 sent out radio messages to the now partially destroyed Station 1 to no reply. They passed it off as a destroyed radio tower, but they saw 
it was still intact. Then they reckoned it was a power failure, but the power came from the tip of the station, far from where the meteor had hit. The staff became worried. They informed the military, who quickly sent teams of soldiers to Station 1 to locate survivors. At around 10.15, the first groups of soldiers arrived through airships. They entered Station 1 through the landing pads located on the top of the station. The first radio messages that came through from a group of soldiers described the now derelict hub. They mentioned that there were a few dead bodies scattered around with mysterious wounds on them. The next messages came through a few minutes later. The soldiers said they were now at the heart of Station 1 and were getting closer to the area the meteor had entered. They said that, so far, they had found no survivors, just dead people. There were no more messages for a good ten minutes. There was then a few more messages. These would be the last ever heard from Station 1. The messages were from a lone soldier. He described how his entire team had been absolutely shredded by those things. He said that they must have come from the meteor, and mumbled about a red mist in the area where the meteor had entered. After those messages, the radio cut to static. Nothing was heard from Station 1. The other soldiers that were going to be sent into the station were told to fall back. The government was updated on the situation at Station 1, and upon hearing of the team of soldiers' deaths, they put Manhattan under quarantine, destroying all bridges and tunnels in and out of the borough, and set up a barrier of Coast Guard vessels around the island. The military were called in to set up defensive perimeters around the city of New York. The things that were in Station 1 were considered a threat to the American people and had to be annihilated as soon as possible. Plans were made to destroy the station but they weren't made quick enough. By 1.34 p.m., the entire island of Manhattan was sealed off. The U.S. Army was deployed around the island and was setting up defensive perimeters. At exactly 1.39 p.m., a large explosion occurred in the upper area of Station 1. This upper area contained all the technology which made the station float. Without that technology, Station 1 would free-fall onto Lower Manhattan. And alas, a few daunting moments after the explosion, Station 1 began its slow descent towards planet Earth. It fell in a motion that pulled it closer towards the island of Manhattan, rather than out to sea. The fall of Station 1 lasted roughly ten seconds before it hit the ground. The shockwave caused by the impact was felt all the way over in New Jersey. The ash and debris from Station 1 covered most of the southern half of Manhattan, stopping just outside Times Square. The damage caused by the impact of Station 1 would not be known until the ash cloud had subsided. But there was another issue. The things that were on board Station 1. It was deemed unlikely that they had survived the impact with the surface of our planet. But we had to make sure. A total of 1,671 soldiers were sent into the ash cloud, wearing protective suits and gas masks. For the first few blocks, all they saw were deserted streets covered in ash. Then, they began to see the red. Streets were covered in what seemed like red goo, and the ash cloud was glowing a deep red. The soldier went and touched the red goo, only to burn himself upon making contact with it. The same soldier collapsed to the ground a few blocks later. His suit was taken off to reveal large boils forming underneath his skin. Those boils eventually exploded in a mixture of blood and the red goo, although it was hard to distinguish between the two. Later on, as they drew nearer to the wreckage of Station 1, 
Many of the soldiers began to discover that the same boils from the dead soldier were forming on their own bodies. They realized that the soldiers with the boils had come in contact with the dead soldier, or the red goo at some point after he infected himself. Slowly, the number of soldiers began to fall from more than a thousand to a few hundred. By the time the soldiers reached Station One's wreckage, there were just a few left with most of those still alive carrying the disease. The soldiers stopped upon entering the wreckage of Station 1, for the red goo had covered the entire crash site. In the ash cloud, which was now glowing an incredibly dark red, the soldiers saw movement. It was when they heard the horrifying scream of a young soldier that most turned to run. Those who stayed behind were attacked, and radio contact with them was lost. The soldiers who ran were being followed by large creatures with blades for arms. The first few soldiers who made it out of the ash cloud were infected, and quickly died before reaching any of the defensive points. By now it was 5.45pm. More soldiers began to rush out of the ash cloud most of them being disease-free. Some of them managed to reach a defensive point and began informing the general in charge of what they'd seen. The general ordered airships into the ash cloud to perform a search and destroy mission. The reluctant pilots of the airships began to make their way towards the ash cloud. Radio transmissions between the airships and the defensive points failed altogether upon the airships entering the ash cloud. A few minutes passed, and then one of the airships returned, except it was in flames. It slowly lowered to the ground before crashing straight into one of the defensive points. The soldiers who survived the crash went to inspect the downed airship. One brave soldier climbed up the side of the airship and opened one of the doors. He looked inside, and suddenly, something pulled him in. The surrounding soldiers were shocked, and the shock turned to terror as the man's lifeless body was flung out again in two halves. A group of the things burst out of the airship and began attacking the soldiers. It was only a few minutes before every soldier in the defensive point was killed by the things, and now more of them were flooding out of the ash cloud making their way across a military-filled Manhattan. The army stood no chance, with the entire military presence on Manhattan being wiped out within a few hours. It was at 1.13 a.m. on the 6th of July, 2106, when the things escaped Manhattan, and from there the human race was doomed to extinction. The red goo covered the land and colored the sea. The things first conquered the United States. Then they moved on to South America, destroying the continent within a month. A coalition was formed between European and Asian armies. They began producing new weaponry in hopes of wiping out the monsters currently wreaking havoc in Australia. But it was no use. The weapons proved ineffective towards the Things, who wiped out Asia within two years, and Europe within one year. Africa was quite obviously the next area the Things would attack, but they never did. After destroying Europe, the Things left Earth. They had destroyed most of the land on the planet, covering it in the red goo which killed all who came into contact with it and contaminated most of the water. But they left Africa unharmed. Was it due to the continent being the birthplace of the human race and intelligent life on Earth? Was it because of its rich landscapes? Who knows? All that is certain is that we had survived. Humanity had made it through what may have been the end of the world. We, as humans, had been given a second chance to live on this planet we call our own. And by God, 
we better make the most out of it. So, a sci-fi compilation for you this evening. A lot of you have been calling out for more sci-fi themed horror stories, so I hope that did the trick. Um, still working on the next episode of Dark Town, my uh, anthology series, but finding the right stories is a little bit tricky, so please bear with me. I've got a couple more stories coming up real soon from some of my favourite writers, so um, a few treats in store over the next few weeks. That's all from me for tonight, though, so for now. Bye-bye.